Okay, I think, you know, people can uh, come in as they come in. So I will say welcome folks and thank you for coming back. Um, we, we uh, as I said, we learned a lot about Zoom last week and how it works effectively. Uh, so what I'm going to do now is go what we call to the gala or the speaker view. That's this. Can you all see me in a fairly large mode? Yes. Yes, good. All right, well, uh, last week we kind of careened from creation to uh, chaos in short order. Uh, and at the end of the class, we found ourselves in um, 587 BC, about 600 years before Christ uh, was born with our fellow Jewish sisters and brothers in captivity. We have just walked about 800 miles from Jerusalem up and then down into Babylon, which is north of the Persian Gulf. And uh, here we sit upon the banks of the rivers of Babylon, weeping when we remembered Zion. As we have been taken captive, where do we find that? It's in Psalm 137. But you thought David wrote all the Psalms. Wrong. Jeremiah, it is ascribed to Jeremiah, this one in Psalm 137, because Jeremiah lived through this Babylonian captivity. But in order to understand the fullness of Judaism and the Hebrew people, I want to refocus for a minute. The Hebrew Bible uh, is really, really well organized. That's our Old Testament. There are three major sections to the Hebrew Bible. One is called the Torah. Uh, that also simply means teaching books, also known as the Pentateuch, or also known as the first five books of Moses. And they are? Anybody? First five books of Moses. Genesis. Exodus. Exodus. Levit Leviticus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Numbers and Deuteronomy. There you go. Genesis, <laughs> Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. That is the first section of the Hebrew Bible called the Torah or the teaching books. The second part of the Hebrew Bible is called the Nevi'im or the prophets. So we have the teaching elders or the teaching books. We have the prophets. And the third part is called the ketuvim uh, or simply the writings. So you have three parts, the teaching part, the prophet part, and the writings part. And it is extremely well ordered. So let's back up. Ancient Israel's history is generally considered to date from Abraham around 2000 BC to 1800 BC, all the way to 587 BC, called the first temple period or the time of the Babylonian captivity. I can't stress enough how important that captivity is because it marks for the Jewish people an enormous transition. So during this period, especially from Abraham to Exodus, the Israelites build their historical foundation, starting with Abraham and the early patriarchs. Then, of course, in time, you all know that Joseph winds up in Egypt, which creates that bridge or that link to Egypt by Joseph, followed by 400 plus years in captivity, because the pharaohs don't remember Joseph. They don't remember the people. So all of these people, plus I suspect a whole bunch of other slaves, <clears throat> are in Egypt. And then after 400 plus years, they are liberated by God from Egypt in an event called, Catherine, this is your clue, the Exodus. <laughs> Israel's greatest prophet, Moses. Now watch what's happening here. They're going to take the bones of Joseph that are buried in Egypt, 
And Moses is going to take those bones with him as the people flee into the wilderness. Okay, there's that link again. In this wilderness, they will be reminded of their past and their link to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, and all their stories. They're going to learn new traditions along with God's laws and commandments. In time, of course, the Jewish laws are about 650 plus of them. They will learn rigid practices. They will learn the social order of society. They will learn the ways of animal sacrifice, and it's brutal. In the books of Exodus and Leviticus later on, all things necessary to bring order to their day-to-day -day lives and their fledgling nation uh, are listed in these books, but, 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 most important, most important, their identity as the covenant people of one God is laid out for them. Very few, if any, cultures exist as well thought out and well written out as the Hebrew people. They are a monotheistic people. They are set apart. They are chosen by the one true God. And this is the period, again, from Abraham to the Babylonian captivity. But right now, we're in the wilderness, and Sheila is going to show us our first clip of the day. All right. Just a moment. Oh, let me hang on. Let me just make sure I did that right. Um, okay. All right. Hang on. All right. I am here. Put off thy shoes from off thy feet. For the place where I thou standest is holy. God has just told Moses to take off his sandals because he's standing on holy ground. The God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. Lord, Lord, why do you not hear the cries of their children in the bondage of Egypt? That happens a lot. God talks to us and we don't listen. <laughs> Can't hear him. My Lord, you should send me. How can I lead this people out of bondage? What words can I speak? Okay, so we're going to uh, stop that, and we're going to, I, I know why that video is not working well, and it has to do with the number of people on Zoom and um, uh, with, without uh, microphones muted and stuff like that. So that's a good learning lesson. Well, once out of the wilderness, so, so basically what happens there with the burning bush is God talks to Moses and he links Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph to those people in the wilderness. And Moses is all upset and says, how can you allow these people to suffer the way they do? Um, and God basically tells Moses everything is going to be all right. And, of course, it, it does become kind of so. So once out of the wilderness now, the people, they've wandered for 40 years. They get all kinds of laws, all kinds of traditions. If you ever want to put yourself to sleep one night, get a, um, 
recording of Leviticus and play it. Uh, <laughs> unbelievable. Well, uh, after they wander and they go out of the wilderness, Moses, of course, does not go with them. Joshua goes, leads them out. We have um, uh, people like the judges, and then we have kings. The people get to the point where they want a king, and so Saul is uh, picked by the people, and it doesn't work well. Why doesn't it work well, folks? Anybody? Speak right up. Unmute yourself. It doesn't work well because he was chosen by the people. Remember again, whenever the people get involved, it tends not to work well for them. But then after Saul is chosen by the people, he goes out of the picture and then David uh, comes into the picture and David works fairly well. Why? Because he's chosen by God. Not long after David, we have Solomon and the building of the first temple, followed by the reign of Solomon's evil sons. David, we mark to be around 1050 AD, Solomon around 980 AD, and then his evil sons after that. Then about 150 years after Solomon and his evil sons, Israel divides into two parts, much like the United States did in the Civil War. There is a northern kingdom to Israel, and there is a southern kingdom to Israel. The northern part of Israel is called just that. It's called Israel, with the capital being Samaria. The southern part of the Israel kingdom is called Judah, with, of course, Jerusalem being its capital. Now, shortly after they have divided, so we come from the exodus to nationalization. Eventually, David becomes king. The first temple is built. And now we get down to about 72 BC, where the Assyrian soldiers and armies will come down into the Fertile Crescent, and they will come down and they will crush the northern kingdom called Israel. And those Israelites who survive will become lost in the dust of history. The Bible does not follow them. However, many assume that, in fact, they were or became assimilated into the Samaritan culture. So, that's that one. And then, of course, the prophets are going crazy during this time, trying to warn people about their disobedience, because that, in the end, is going to be their undoing. 140 years after that northern kingdom is crushed, guess who comes up from the land of the Euphrates and Tigris, north of the Persian Gulf, near where Abraham was born? Why, it's those Babylonians. The Babylonian culture started around 24, 2300 BC, but now we are in 597 BC, thousands of years later. They come up and they'll come down into the Fertile Crescent. They'll come through the lands that are occupied by the Assyrians. And yes, like Pac-Man, they gobble up the Assyrians. They come south into Judah and they wage war and siege for almost 10 years. What do they eventually do, these nasty Babylonians under King Nebuchadnezzar? Well, they end up crushing Judah along with the holy city of Jerusalem, and they destroy Solomon's temple. The Judahites, those who are still alive after battle, and we are told that thousands were killed, they were marched back up out of the Fertile Crescent, all the way east, wherever east is for you guys, to Babylon, about 800 miles, where we currently sit at the rivers and weep as we remember Zion. Okay, 
So now the northern kingdom is gone. We've had David. That's the golden years. David and Solomon are the golden years of the um, Hebrew faith and the Hebrew people. We had, we go into that time when they're kind of mucking around in their sins after uh, Solomon. Life is not so good for a couple hundred years. And then, of course, it gets even worse when the Assyrians clobber the northern kingdom. And then the Babylonians come up and eventually destroy the southern kingdom. How is it that God's people can be destroyed, right? God made a covenant with these Hebrew people. God said he would protect these people. A covenant implies a two-way street. God kept his end of the bargain. The Hebrews, according to theology, did not. So, what do we have? The prophet Jeremiah will open the writings of his book with a very somber note referring to the fall of Jerusalem. And it says, How lonely sits the city, she that was once full of people. He's referring to Jerusalem. Which, by the way, is a good time to reflect on the creation story in chapter one of Genesis. So folks, uh, we'll go there in just a second. What in the world does sitting around in captivity in Babylon in 587 BC have anything, and I do mean anything, to do with creation? Most scholars believe that this period is when chapter 1 of Genesis was written. It is also believed that chapter 2, which is the Adam and Eve story, which was written about 100 or 200 years earlier uh, in the northern kingdom of Israel, um, what does that have to do with anything? Well, there are a lot of Jewish people and a lot of evangelical right-leaning Christians who believe that the first five books of the Hebrew Bible, our Old Testament, were written by Moses almost 800 years before the Babylonian captivity. Why are there, why are there two creation stories? Well, Adam and Eve interact with God. And what happens when people interact with God? They get in trouble. 200 years after the writing of Adam and Eve, Israel is no more. It is laid to waste by two different empires. Why? Because of the disobedience of the chosen people worshiping multiple gods. And that's what archaeology finds is a number of multiple gods in those pre-conquest, pre-captivity homes. They also ended up breaking the covenant. So chapter one, brilliantly written, and God said, and God said, and God said, addresses the people problem. How does it do that? Anybody? There aren't any people in chapter one that interact with God. So it makes it real simple. And the writers are responding to a people problem. And when the people mess up and the nation is utterly destroyed, basically the writers are acknowledging that Israel has broken the covenant with God and God has allowed his people to be taken captive. So... Chapter 1 has a superb literary style showing the sovereignty of God. And uh, though it is written after the Adam and Eve story, guess who gets to place it first in the Hebrew scriptures? The priests and the scribes that are in Babylon. Hmm. The Hebrew scriptures say right up front, in the beginning, God. In the beginning, God. 
So with that, we're gonna show another video clip and hope this one gets a little bit better shot than the other one. It was my fault. I, for, I forgot to tell it to have the, the sound. So I'll fix that this time. Okay. Your, your, your assistant is not that great. Well, she is. No, she isn't. <laughs> yeah, Maggie's clapping. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Let me try it again. Here we go. In the beginning, yes. God created the heavens and the Found. earth. Yep. Yep. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Then God said, Let there be light. And there was light. And God saw the light that it was good, and God divided the light from the darkness. Then God said, let the waters under the heavens be gathered together into one place, and let the dry land appear. And it was so. And God called the dry land earth, and the gathering together of the waters he called seas. And God saw that it was good. Then God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day, and the lesser light to rule the night. He made the stars also. Then God said, Let us make man in our image, according to our likeness. And he has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on all the face of the earth, so that they should seek the Lord, though he is not far from each one of us. Thank you. Okay, we're getting close to uh, the end of our wrap up with the ancient Judahites, but I want to look at creation. For many of us, when do you think creation occurred? Come on, folks, unmute yourself. You're bright. I know you are. When did creation occur in well, most they, of they our minds? Uh, uh, the the conventional uh, um, the view is is, is six thousand years ago in, in terms of the biblical version. Right, but how about for us? Billions, billion. Yeah, billions. actually, Catherine is right. <laughs> Catherine is right. Uh, but billions of years ago, for many folks who believe it's when creation started. Back to you, Catherine. If you are a devout Jew, if we are devout Jews and we're sitting in Babylon, what year are we in? Well, we've gone out of Babylon. We're sitting here in our homes. What year is it today for if we're devout Jews? Uh, it's 6,000 and something. Uh, today, today, no, today is um, Easter. <laughs> no, no, no. David told me it was it was um, for the Orthodox or something like Greek that. Greek Orthodox Easter. Yes, Orthodox. indeed. Today, right. today, our year of we're devout Jews is 5,781. Mm -hmm. And more important to us being devout Jews, when did creation occur? Catherine answered our question. You got it. Oh. Almost 6,000 years ago. 2,000 years, 2,000 plus years prior to Abraham. What did we say about um, Jericho? It was about 10,000 years old. Highly impossible if you're a devout Jew. Almost 6,000 years ago, 2,000 plus years before Abraham, creation, folks, was not all that old to priests and scribes of Judah sitting around in Babylon contemplating their scriptures. This was a period of much scripture writing for the Hebrew people. That is why the Babylonian captivity is so important, because it is felt that much of the Hebrew Bible, a strong part of it, was written while they were in captivity. Now, again, remember, if you're a devout Jew, you don't believe that. You believe that Moses wrote everything in the first five books of the Bible, the Torah, except, of course, the last few sentences about his death. You figure an editor 
put some sentences in there about Moses' death. Now, we come down the years, we have all been taken captive by 587, 86 BC. And in 539, guess who comes in from the east? Who are the wise men? Not the wise, they didn't come in from the east, but the Persian Empire rolls into Babylon practically without a fight. The Persian king, King Cyrus, encourages the Jews to leave Babylon and return to Jerusalem. How do we know this? There is an artifact called the Cyrus Cylinder, named after King Cyrus. It was excavated a while back in which the king on this cylinder, there are lots of little inscribings, encourages foreigners to return to their lands. For scholars, here's the important part of all this. Most acknowledge that the Israelites are now Jews. They are from Judah. They are known as Judahites, and from that we get Jews. In ancient times, pre-captivity, Israelites. In post-captivity, Judahites or Jews, and according to the world of archaeology, and this is really critical, almost no other gods in the rebuilt homes of Jerusalem. They are now firmly ensconced with monotheism, one God. Of course, now, I guess, if somebody were to excavate our homes in years to come, they might find Hopi Katsinas, and they might say, well, they had lots of other gods sitting around in their home. But uh, in all times, in all times, whether it's Israelites or Jews or Judahites, in all times, they are known as the Hebrew people, the people of God, God's chosen people, the Israelites, the Jews, and, of course, the Jewish culture and the Hebrew culture. We're going to move forward fast. I'm going to do this in about one or two minutes to get to our next section. The return to Jerusalem is completed, and we find Nehemiah and Ezra rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem around 440 BC. So about 70, 80 years after they take off and they go back home, they are rebuilding walls. Over time, the second temple is built in Jerusalem. 100 years, let us never forget that there's always an oppressor on the horizon. 100 years after Nehemiah and Ezra, a guy named Alex, Alex the Great sweeps down with the Greek armies and the ways of the Greeks are forced upon the Jews. Alexander the Great sweeps around the world and eventually takes Jerusalem yet again. Um, and the, the whole concept, I'm not going to get into this today, but the concept of that is called Hellenization or Hellenism. In 166 BC, about 130 years later, a group within Israel known as the Maccabees have had it with the Greeks, and they revolt. And believe it or not, the revolt is successful. And one of the first things that the Maccabees do is cleanse the temple. Thus we get the Festival of Lights, better known as Monica. Thank you, whoever said that. Unfortunately, the Maccabees' success is somewhat short-lived. Remember, with the Jews, there is always an oppressor on the horizon somewhere. Who is the oppressor coming up next around, though, after 100, after 100 AD, uh, BC? Rome. Rome, Yes. The Romans are going to arrive on the scene and become the dominant world power. And in 63 BC, King Herod becomes the ruler of Israel on behalf of the Romans. It is into this world that Jesus is born. For the Jewish world, life goes on. Their sense of identity is strong. That's one of the most takeaway things you can take is the Hebrew people have a determination that is unparalleled. They will continue to live in a world of persecution and turmoil. For the rest of the world, a new creation is about to begin. 
And we are going to go directly to a DVD that has been filmed by a gentleman named N.T. Wright, who is one of the great scholars, theologians of the 2021st century, and his uh, companion, Michael Bird, who is uh, the Dean of Theology in Melbourne, Australia. So Sheila, if you would cue up our DVD. Okay, we're going a moment. To start. Um, there, there, okay. I think you guys will enjoy this. By the way, the second half of this DVD is beyond important. It's probably the most important part of what I've said so far in the last two classes. The Christian faith started small and inconspicuously. Here, in a hillside village of modern Nazareth, we can see a recreation of how slow and simple life might have been, which makes it all the more amazing how fast Christianity grew to become a worldwide movement. By 70 AD, a mere 40 years after Jesus' death, there were Christian gatherings spread as far as Palestine, Syria, Asia Minor, Greece, Italy, Arabia, and North Africa. This new religious movement, calling themselves Nazarenes, referring to the city of Nazareth, and followers of the way, were soon labeled as Christians, devotees of Christ. These Christians were something of a perplexing conundrum for Jewish leaders as to what to do with them, and a thorn in the side of Roman authorities. The early church was thoroughly Jewish in its worldview and beliefs, but it promptly attracted a large number of converts from among Greeks and Romans, as well as Gentiles who followed Jewish customs. The floodgates were wide open and Christianity was exploding across the world. Tom, what would you say were the three biggest events that shaped the world of Jesus and the Apostles? I think the first thing that shaped their world was to go back and see what happened when Alexander the Great conquered the whole of what we call the ancient Near East, including, of course, centrally, the Holy Land, the land of Judea, Palestine. And as a result of his conquests, the whole of that enormous, vast area not only learned to speak Greek, but they were infected by Greek culture and they started to think in quite different ways. And Alexander and his successors <coughs> kind of forced that on the whole of the area down as far as south as Egypt and uh, as far east as almost India. And then after that, there was a great Syrian king called Antiochus Epiphanes at the start of the second century BC. And he came to extend his empire southwards he, he marched down and took Jerusalem and desecrated the temple and made it impossible for loyal Jews to worship there and so there was then a three-year revolutionary movement led by the Maccabean family and they in those three years defeated Antiochus Epiphanes they cleansed the temple and that was enough actually to establish him and his family as putative royal house for the next hundred and plus years and so we can see already events which are shaping the consciousness of Jewish people at the time of Jesus because they were all thinking that's what we want to happen only this time we want it really to last and really to work and so when the Romans came in which was in the middle of the first century BC when Pompey took Jerusalem in 63 BC and then after that when Octavian who became Augustus became the first Roman Emperor then Judea became part of the Roman Empire and was taxed and was ruled and so on and there were long memories of these wave upon wave of imperial ambitious pagan overtaking of the local Judean culture it was that context within which we can understand the aspirations of Jesus and his contemporaries that one day God would come and do finally what they'd always wanted him to do what it said in the Psalms and the prophets that he would do so as the Jewish people of Jesus day looked back and thought about who they were and what they were praying for and so on they wanted their God to come back and do something which would enable their culture to flourish not the Greek one that had been imposed on them they wanted their religion their temple to be cleansed once and for all so that God and his people would finally get it together and they wanted above all their God to come and to be king so that instead of Caesar as Lord over them they would have their one true God instead
Here we are in the synagogue at Capernaum. This is actually a fourth century synagogue, though most people think it's built on the site where there would have been a first century synagogue. And a synagogue, the Greek word means coming together, is the place where the community would gather, not just for prayer and worship, but for all sorts of meetings that, about the things that concerned them, whether economic or social or political or cultural. So this is the focal point of the small town Capernaum that Jesus made his home during his public career. Now, in a place like this, there would be all sorts of activities going on, we're right by the Sea of Galilee, so that fishing is one of the main occupations, but there is farming locally, there are small industries, and just up the road there is the border between the territory of Herod and the territory of Philip, and every time you cross the border you have to pay the tax, which at once rings bells for people who read the New Testament, because we know that Jesus called one of the tax collectors who was working there, uh, Matthew. But this is also the place where Jesus called several others of his disciples. Now, a community like this in the first century was faced with several major issues. Rome had come in nearly a century before and had made life extremely uncomfortable for some, although since the main garrison was stationed north of here in Syria, there weren't Roman soldiers around the place all the time. It wasn't a very heavy-handed presence, but everyone was aware of it, not least again because of economic taxation reasons and because particularly of that bubbling sense that carried on throughout the whole period that something was wrong, something was amiss. They were still not fully restored to be the people of God in the way they should have been. And particularly the great prophecies from Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel, the great things they sang about in the Psalms, precisely in synagogues like this one. These promises had not yet come true. But how would they come true? There were all sorts of movements and factions and parties and people saying, maybe this is what we ought to do to make the kingdom of God come. Or maybe we're, all we should do is stay quiet and pray. Or maybe we should organize in some new way or reinterpret the ancient laws. So there were revolutionary movements, some of them not far from here, before the time of Jesus and after the time of Jesus. Galilee was a place where revolutions could bubble up quite easily and get quite hot. And then there were the Pharisees who were a group, a populist group, a pressure group, if you like, whose aim was that though they weren't themselves priests in the temple, they would try to live in their personal lives in such a state of holiness and purity as if they were actually in the temple themselves. They were a democratizing group, trying to make the ancient religion relevant to every aspect of daily life and also particularly to keep Israel special, to keep the people of God different and distinct from the rest of the world, so that then God would come and vindicate them. Then there were, of course, the Sadducees. You wouldn't hear so much about them here in Galilee because they were the aristocracy largely based in Jerusalem from which the chief priests would be drawn. And there were other movements like the Essenes. Uh, we know of the Dead Sea Scrolls found at Qumran that seemed to represent a collection of Essene writings of people who were praying and waiting, waiting for God to act and ready to play their part if and when that happened. So it was in a place like this that Jesus of Nazareth started some of his public teaching. He went around all the villages, but he, this was his home and he would come here and, and Sabbath by Sabbath, he would be either teaching or discussing or debating and he would be talking about the kingdom of God. It was kind of the natural thing for people to think about in a place like this. And it had ramifications all across the society, echoing through those different parties and movements and aspirations. But Jesus had a different dream, and that was why he spent so much time explaining it. Sheila, go ahead and move us up to uh, 1230, 1227. As we've already mentioned, the world of Jesus and the apostles was one that was dominated culturally by Greek or, or Hellenistic. Sheila, yeah. now, move us up to 1227, please. Okay. Which is the second largest. I like Michael, but not that much. <laughs> okay. 1227? Oh, yeah, you're right, right there. Okay. 
This is the important part, folks, this, this next seven or eight minutes. By the time that Jesus of Nazareth was born, more or less the whole of the Mediterranean world was under the control of Rome, whether directly or indirectly. The Roman Forum here was the place where decisions were made which affected people all the way from Spain right through to Judea and Egypt and beyond. How had that come about? And how did that context change and transform and illuminate and indeed threaten the life of the early church? It all goes back a long way because Rome had been quite a powerful city-state for hundreds of years, gradually extending its influence in Italy and then through both trade and conquest further afield. Of course, Alexander the Great, three centuries before, had more or less turned his bit of the world Greek, but much of that had not lasted in terms of direct rule from Greece over the rest of the world, but it had been a cultural influence seeping into the way people thought the things they did, the books they may have read. Whereas with Rome, it was a bit more direct and brutal. As in the late years of the Republic, the last two centuries BC, the Romans extended their influence, their military domain, their power and their prestige. But Rome had always been a democracy, at least for the last few hundred years. They'd had tyrants way back when, they decided that wasn't a good idea, and so instead they had a complicated system of checks and balances where the different social classes would be able to get along more or less together. And each year they elected two men to be consuls, and they would serve in office just for that year, and then they would go off and work abroad for a while, thus preventing anyone getting too powerful. But when Julius Caesar did become too powerful for the liking of most of them, then they assassinated him in 44 BC, precipitating the whole Roman world into a time of chaos, of civil anarchy and of civil war. They didn't actually fight the civil war here in Rome. They exported their wars into places like northern Greece. And it was only sometime later in 31 BC that Julius Caesar's adopted son, Octavian, finally defeated Antony and Cleopatra and he became master of the Roman world. And what Octavian then said about what he'd done and who he was and how all that worked had enormous influence in shaping the world of the next generation, the world of Jesus of Nazareth, the world into which Paul came with his gospel. Because Octavian declared that he had brought peace to the world, he had brought salvation to the world, he had brought justice to the world. A new day had come, a new day had dawned because he was hailed as the son of the deified Julius. Julius Caesar had been declared to be divine after his death and Octavian, his son and heir, therefore was designated son of God. It's on the coins. And the coins introduce us to the symbolic world of Rome. The symbols which were so tiny you could put several of them into a little purse, in other words coins, and the symbols which were so massive that they took weeks, months and years to build, like some of these temples and triumphal arches behind me. And all of these symbols said, we Romans have conquered the world by our military might and as a result we have brought justice and peace to the world. Peace as a result of conquest, justice as a result of our military might. And so all these symbols gathered together and they didn't just exist here in Rome because wherever the Romans went, they planted colonies. Colonies like in Corinth and Philippi and Pisidian Antioch, and dozens of other places around the world, precisely the world into which Paul went with the gospel. And everywhere where they planted colonies, people said, we want this to look like and be like and feel like Rome itself. That's the world we want to live in. And so when the gospel went and Paul proclaimed in a place like Antioch that Jesus of Nazareth was the Son of God, was the Saviour, and that he had revealed the divine justice before the world, then this was directly in your face to the claims of the Roman Empire. Of course, for Paul, this language came straight out of his Bible, the Old Testament, where it was the divine justice that was exemplified and acted out in God's mighty acts in history. But we can see from the beginning that there was going to be a clash of categories. And so that the story which was told by Octavian's court poets, people like Virgil and Horace, was a story of the ancient republic turning at last into a monarchy with one man who summed up all the virtues and blessings of Rome. And over against that, 
Paul and the others told a story of the true God and his purposes through history, with the story of Israel coming to its great climax in the arrival of the true Son of God, the Savior of the world, Jesus himself. Ela, go ahead and cut it at this point. Okay. So, folks, I hope you caught that. This is a very, very recent video. It's the most recent one that uh, NT uh, or Tom Wright has has put out, and that is that one. And he kind of you'd miss it if you weren't real careful. Um, that the Roman emperor was the son of God. The Roman emperor brought justice and peace and salvation. And that is what the disciples or Paul are talking about, that Jesus, no, it wasn't the Roman emperor who was the son of God. It was Jesus who was the son of God. And by the way, that God is very different than the one that you Romans worship, which is a man or a person. This understanding is so important to understanding that world, that on one hand, you had a son of God for the Romans. On the other hand, you had a son of God for the one true God. And that is where we leave off today, because um, when Jesus was about 10 years old, apart from going into the temple, there was a bloody bloody revolution in Jerusalem that is described as the streets were flowing with blood when the uh, some of the Jewish revolutionaries went up against the Romans. And the Romans were truly brutal, and they slaughtered those Jewish revolutionaries. And, um, and therefore, you had the beginning of a Jewish revolt but you also had the most important thing that was going on, and that is the determination of the Hebrew people to keep their own identity. And in that world, you have the emerging culture of Christianity, and you have the Son of God, Jesus, against the Son of God in the Roman culture. You see that? See how then the two clash at that point? And this is some of the later... Uh, scholasticism that is affecting our world. Now, I will go to gallery view to see all of you lovely folks. <laughs> uh, but it's so important as we conclude for the moment with our foray into the Hebrew faith that you see those people as well-organized, literary, well-written, strong people who are determined to keep their identity. And that will continue all the way through. But we will see uh, what happens to them next week, as we'll see what happens to the Christians as well. You have this kind of merging towards each other, and then they go apart. Any questions? Very interesting. Yeah, I was going to say, Catherine, you should know this history down cold. <laughs> <laughs> I have a little familiarity with it, yes. <laughs> yes, you do. Okay, so Ed and Elliot and Liz, Maggie, Bonnie, Jim and Janet, uh, Joanne, Billy, hi there, and Catherine and Susan, thank you all for being here today. We will see your lovely faces, same time, same channel, same bat station, 856, 857, next Sunday on this um, PBS station, <laughs> Zoom station. <laughs> Bye, guys. Come on. Yep. <laughs>